you believe we're 25 episodes in? No, but I, I think we met when I was 25. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot sense. of sense. 25 episodes. One for each year you were around without me. <laughs> and now I don't know what that life is like. <laughs> could never live without me now. Now I'm like Ooh. daily dose of crazy. You need a little bit of Syrah. I'm crazy in my own regard. We know this. This is why we love each other. <clears throat> Gosh, no idea how anyone tolerates us for, for long periods of time. <laughs> so I'm just going to put this out in the open before we even start. You continue to push me into this. I'll call it humanizing because it's one of your words territory. Every time we record an episode, you want to shift it into like more of an emotional, touchy-feely. How does it make you feel? What does it make you think about it? And I'm not used to that, to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. And this episode, similar to talking to Nick about my finances, this is super personal to me. So I spent pretty much since we talked about doing this episode having anxiety about doing this episode. <laughs> and I'm also, I know you said you weren't drinking. I'm also not drinking. So I was like, what am I going to do while we're talking? It's, um, well, first of all, I'm so proud of you for accepting the vulnerability I've asked you to do because <sighs> people that listen to this, you have to realize that they're not in a big room. They're on a walk. They're folding laundry. It's their own personal time. They're washing dishes, whatever. I have to take in my morning shower. That's when I listen to episodes. Yeah. You're your most vulnerable. So if we, we should be our most vulnerable alongside mm. our listeners. That's mm. my, that's my thing. But thank you for, for coming on this journey with me. So what are we talking about? <laughs> well, we're talking about risk of a different kind. So I f think we circled around this idea that we both like to take risk. We like to measure us. We like to do it in different ways. And instead of talking about financial goals, I made the mistake earlier this week of texting you and saying, hey, maybe we should talk about personal goals. The mistake. <laughs> you know when you like send a text message and you're like, God, I wish I could go back and edit or delete because I yeah. can do that in like chat at work. Why is that not a function? Because <laughs> they're like, it's in writing. It's forever. It's forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's personal. Okay. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is very personal. So tell me, tell me like two to three of your personal goals. Okay. So when you texted me this, I was thinking about, I Googled things like, um, what are people's top personal goals, right? And the things that kept coming up, it was like New Year's Eve. And I feel like everyone at the beginning of a New Year is like, look, this year sucked. 2020 sucked. 2021 is going to be best. And here's a whole list of personal goals. And then I thought, do I do the same thing? And for a while, I was definitely on that board. You know, I was on that New Year's Eve setting goals. Um, but as I've gotten older, I actually have started to shape my goals with how I'm feeling. So my personal goals as a woman, to be honest, are always around weight loss, which is so sad, or how I'm feeling or looking, I'm just being completely honest. Um, more recently, since our work together are financial goals, which actually feels really good to me um, to be able to set those and understand what my numbers are, et cetera. Um, and then much more recent for me has been goals around work-life balance, to be honest. It's how do I balance like my career and my progression of growth and learning in a way that feels good and honest to me, but also, you know, what are my personal relationships and how are those continuing to grow? Um, and so I've started to kind of bucketize them in three buckets and it's not as regimented as I bet you are, but it's, it's very more, Hey, how do I feel personally and make sure that's at its core? How am I doing financially to empower the things that I want to do? And then really at the crux of all of it, how is my family situation and relationships, my personal relationships and my partner? Like those are the things that I really thematically try to live my life through when I look at personal goals. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love hearing all of that. And I think, I think you probably 
echo the sentiment of a lot of women out there, particularly between the weight loss and the financial goals and especially with the pandemic, understanding work-life balance better because I think so many of us either had to drop out because a lot of women were working two jobs as a mom and as whatever their day job was, or they were forced to just grind, which two of my favorite people, Nick and one of my best friends, Carol, made fun of me a couple days ago uh, where Carol was like, Nick, how do you handle the fact that Syra fills every spare second of her time. And I was kind of stunned because I guess in my brain, I know that I do that, but I just assume nobody else knows that. And I don't know why that would be a secret. It's but not a secret. <laughs> it's not a secret. Totally true. <laughs> but I also but I also want to acknowledge that so many of us have been grinding for the last year and like your workday starts as soon as you're for me, as soon as I'm showered my work day starts and it finishes when I'm done which is substantially longer than when you're in an office and you can like cut off the work day so uh definitely things that I've all been thinking about so I, I love hearing that you're contemplating all those do you set your goals at, at on New Year's Eve is that when you typically do it I used to when I when I was younger I definitely did I would like write them down I was very it was very religious of me to yeah. do that you know yeah. um wrote them down in a notebook. Like when I was turning 30, I was like, things I'll do by when I'm 31. <laughs> and those were all not going to happen, you know? Like go to Italy again. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, you're, you're not 30 or 31. You know that, right? I am 31. You're 32. No, no. In September. Don't age me. <laughs> <laughs> do not age me. I'm not looking forward to this birthday. Um, oh, stop it. I'm not. Anyway, uh, yeah. age is just the number. But uh, embrace you your thirties. Have- Tell me your thirties aren't way better than your twenties, right? Oh no, I'm I'm into it. I'm into my thirties. But, yeah. but okay, to your question though, do I set goals on New Year's Eve? Yes, I used to. Now it ebbs and flows. As you know, I'm Type A, and so I used to have, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, I would have a whiteboard in front of me in my old apartment, and I had it in three buckets, and I had every day of the week filled out. And I would reset goals at the beginning of the week. I would say, okay, I want to eat seven veggies a day. I want to make sure I'm walking and doing yoga at least three to four times a day. Um, And then I want to make sure I'm getting eight glasses of water a day. And I would literally like tick and tie and it sat right in front of me. And so I'd have to like put the the X's. Like at work, they'd be like, how are you doing on the chart? (laughs) And I'd have to like send them photos. But that got too all consuming for me. And I started to feel guilty. I started to feel guilty looking at it being like, oh, I didn't work out enough or I didn't do this enough. Um, and it, so it just kind of became too routine and like checking a box to check the box. And so I wasn't really checking in with myself. And so for me, it's evolved into how do I wake up and live my best day every day, which is so effing hard to do, to just be like, how do I feel and how do I want to feel and how do I complain less? <laughs> Um, so I don't really have like a template, like to say, here's how I set my personal goals. It kind of, I don't know, ebbs and flows. I've said that like 10 times, but it's really true. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, sure. No, I I love, I like hearing people's processes. I think it's going to be different for each individual. So I know, I know yours has got to be a little more templatized, I imagine. Cause yeah, I'm you, in, yeah. Let's talk about know. your personal goals. You want to start there? Or you want to start with the process? They're both intense. <laughs> I think stem off of what I said, right? Like I, I'm talking about like theoretical. This is how I. This is what I think, and then we can get down into the process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how do you think? How do you think? So yeah, the I took this incredible course in college and it was probably the only course that was useful to me and it was called uh, how to make a million dollars and it was an elective and the professor in there and I feel like I've probably talked about him he was called the gorilla and I don't know he was either a zillion years old or he was like 50 years old I'll never know and he said you anytime you have like specific targeted goals in mind you create a binder and you have 
a one week goal, a one month goal, a six month, a one year, a five year and a 10 year. And you revisit those goals every single week and you rewrite the things that you're going to do every single week to achieve those goals. And I used to have a physical binder that started to get tedious the smaller my apartment got when I was growing up. And then eventually I just shifted to uh, the computer that I want you to murder if I ever die and like throw into the ocean. Oh, yeah. And so now in that computer, I do the same thing where I delineate individual long-term goals and then I break down the steps to achieve each of those and like whenever that target horizon is similar to my investment portfolio, I alter and change the strategy and change whatever I need to change, whether it's needing more time to focus on something or whether it's shifting certain aspects of my life in order to make sure that I'm handling things the way that I want to handle them. So, I mean, it's not lost on me that you don't look at things very analytically. At what part, when you look at your personal goals, does it become emotional for you? I can actually give you an example. I can give you two examples. Uh, Seeing my nephew for the first time, I was like, I'm never going to live in California. I hate that state. Right? Like anytime somebody asked me what my favorite city and my least favorite city was, it would be like least favorite LA, most favorite Seattle or Cleveland. And now that I've seen my nephew, I'm like, when am I moving to LA? Right? And so that my goal, my dream in life has at one point was to live in Denver, which is where I live now. And there was a piece of me that really wanted to move to Barcelona for a while. And that, that changed. And now it's how can I be closer to my nephew as quickly as possible versus how can I, you know, buy as many houses, like, like whatever the other ancillary goals were. I suddenly was like, I need to taper down on some other stuff in order to refocus on being with my nephew. And I made that I actually made that one of my one-year goals after I met him when he was born. Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to be present for his early years. I want to make sure that my sister doesn't completely ruin him as a human. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to be there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, I I think a lot of people can resonate with that, Sai. Like, for real. Um, I think there's so many things that you can plan out in your life, but things happen. And I think it shifts our goals and what happens next and... I know you and I both strongly believe this, but family is everything, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and we both want to be closer to our families physically and emotionally and whatever. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it also reminds me of uh, when we interviewed Morgan and he was talking about some study that he read or something and people were asked on their deathbeds. Like, do you wish you made more money? And everyone said no. You know, and everything was very emotional and personal. Like, I'm happy I got to live in L.A. and watch my nephew grow up and have kids alongside my sister or or what have you. So, yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that's actually another one, right? That was that you just hit on the other one that I've had to move the goalpost on repeatedly. So, you know, when I was 22 years old and, you know, bright, doughy eyed young gal, that was getting married at the very young age of 25. Ladies, if you're listening, do not get married at 25. Please date. Anyways, so I know. was like, I'm going to have a baby by the time I'm 30. Oh, yeah. I'm old. I still don't have a baby. I have moved that goalpost out. At like Now I'm like one by 40 and I'm good. <laughs> like I would just love to have one little baby. Mm-hmm. But that's another one that, you know, and it, it's almost not emotional for me anymore. It's just like, it's a goal and I can't set a time horizon on that because I'm physically struggling to do that. But that's another personal one that I have. And I mean, there are two, and I think you know both of these. One would be for me to run a nonprofit that specifically is tied to enabling people financially. I do, I'm very passionate about financial empowerment specifically for like unbanked and underbanked people and and really just the education surrounding that and getting people into the financial system however they can or are needed 
like need to use the financial system. And then uh, the last one, which is one that I actually started to check off and then had to take a break from was uh, becoming a yoga instructor, which is something I wanted to do since I was a kid. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And that one shifted drastically because I was, I, I took the 12 week program and we were like six weeks deep and the pandemic hit and suddenly, you know, the country shut down and I didn't, I didn't complete my certification. And that one has, I continue to stare at it because I'm like, am I, am I ever going to be comfortable enough to go back into a yoga studio with all of the health problems that I have and go get my certification in person? But I think some of the things I talked about that maybe you could take, it's like it ebbs and flows, right? Like there's some things that that just change our goals a little bit. And I know that's hard for you to di- probably digest because me, I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, new goal. Here we go. And I write it on the mirror. And I'm like. <laughs> and are you one of those girls that writes it in lipstick too? Do you like, do you go know, all I, the way? In? Oh. I got dry erase markers. No, don't write it in lipstick. That's like one thing you do <laughs> one time and then you realize it smears the whole thing. <laughs> and you're like, not only have I ruined my lipstick, but Windex doesn't oh. get the shit out. I feel yeah, like that don't do it with an expensive lipstick either. No, no I'm, I get you. I get yeah. you. Okay. 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 Go as we flow. Okay. So if you're talking about how do we, okay. One of the ones you touched on, I think easily bridges the gap into finance, which is fertility in general. So the expense of a child, which I, I, I'm sure you have the numbers on in your head. Yeah. Like, you know, how much is a kid going to cost from conception till 18? And we all know $250,000 at minimum. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right. Um, That's if yeah. you're lean. Yeah. yeah. And if they have an expensive taste, who knows? You know, our kids are, <laughs> God, we're screwed. You know what I mean? God. Shit. Um, no, that that's one that I think is an interesting topic that we should have a series on too. Um, down the road but how do you how do you look at that like for you in particular like having setting, a baby no a well, little setting like personal goals with financial like w- what's your secret there what do you do so i think when you set a personal goal one of the most important things is to understand the financial impact not only on yourself but and like in the future right so me saying I might potentially have to get a surrogate. And after doing extensive research on surrogates, understanding that that's $150,000 plus to to do a surrogate, I, that's me taking money out of my investment portfolio and having to shift what could potentially be a lot of value in the future and shifting it to a baby, which to me personally, that opportunity cost, right, is worth so much more than, um, it's worth so much more than anything that's in my investment portfolio, period. But then there's also the additional costs that are tied to that, right? So what happens when, if I want to travel or if I need to travel and the surrogate needs something like during the nine and a half to 10 months that she's pregnant and what happens uh, after the baby is born, right? So me giving you that number of $250,000, understanding the costs affiliated with it, whether, you know, at the time when I started planning this, I was single, I was by myself. And I was like, how many IVFs, which each IVF can cost upwards of $20,000. How many times do you go through that? So that's an additional cost separate from the surrogate that I've already incurred. How many, like if I have to, if I need to work in order to pay for this baby, how am I, like, how do I split my time? Am I going to take an easier job that's going to end up paying me less, but per- perhaps give me the flexibility of dealing with my child more? Or do I find a, you know what I mean? There's just so many, there's so many fin- financial decisions there. It's like career path shifts. It's, it's like understanding exactly how much you think the baby's going to cost and understanding it's probably going to 2X because you're probably wrong on a monthly basis. And like, and then if you do have a kid and you do have a job, whether you're single or not, you're probably going to need a babysitter. So does that mean that you go move near your parents if you're fortunate enough to have parents that want to take care of your kid? Or do you suck it up and pay for like a night nurse and a day nanny so that you can sleep at night and not want to die in the morning um, and then deal with having a babysitter, which 
I have looked at the cost of all of those and I will most likely go broke if I have to. You know what I mean? Uh, but these are all there. There's a financial impact to every single aspect of the baby, whether it's the fertility part, the raising the kid, the schooling, like feeding a child, feeding a hungry child. I know I'm going to have hungry children. There's no way I'm going to have kids that don't like food as much as I do. Oh, yeah, for sure. You and sushi. Um, but uh, <laughs> It's all so much and it all can be so overwhelming. Like even just hearing you say it, I'm like, God, I'm just trying to get married or like engaged. You know, I haven't even like crossed that bridge. Of course, I want to have kids like me and my partner want to have kids. But how many and can we? And, you know, you start to kind of go down this spiral, especially as a woman. You're like, can I even have children? Should I get tested? How much does that cost? Um, it, you should, it, and it's super cheap, by the way, but we, we will definitely do a series on that because I think fertility is so important, and there's this like black hole where yes. none of us get to really talk about it, and our gynecologists don't really share enough information. And I feel like, like we talked about this, our podcast would have been named Between the Stirrups, mm-hmm. where we say all the awkward things we're thinking while somebody's hand is up between your legs. But realistically, <laughs> like, are you really asking all of the questions you want to ask to your gynecologist? I have an amazing gynecologist here, and I still hold back. I don't know, 60 to 70% of what's going through my brain. Cause I'm like, if I ask this, how weird am I? Like, you know? Yes. Yes. Oh yes. Between the stirrups. Um, okay. But we're not trying to overwhelm people that are listening. Cause now I'm like reeling a little bit. I'm like, Oh my <laughs> God, there's so much. Like there's so much. Let's, let's try to break it down a little bit because I know we've talked about this offline and I think it'd be good for people to hear Sai. When you start to look at your personal goals, like how do you start to, map them out and then look at them through a financial lens. Like, do you have a template, a roadmap? What does that look like for you? So, so let's talk about the nonprofit. It's tied to my financial background. Right. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to walk backwards from dream goal where, you know, the Siren Megan Purcell Ramon foundation that enables women to financial literacy. How do we get there? And in my brain, I'm like, okay, so that's going to require significant funding from people that believe that we have enough backing and understand the financial literacy world. So what are some things that I can do to get me there? So then I take another step back and I'm like, one, start projecting my voice and building my brand as much as possible, telling people I am here for financial literacy. I want to provide financial literacy. Where can I provide that not only via nonprofits. So some of the nonprofits that I work with are specifically in the education world, specifically public education where it's free. Um, and then, and then simultaneously what I'm doing with my career, because my career will accelerate not only my educational base, right. And my expectation is that I teach myself different skill sets in every job as I go through it. But eventually my goal is to expand into something that ties directly to what my prior career was. So, that's also building my career out at the same time. So I learned institutional sales and like balance sheet hedging at one point in my life. I've now shifted from that into, I shifted from that into community banking so I can understand like people and just like really basic nuanced stuff. And then I shifted again and now I'm doing crazy stuff that I can't speak 80% of the time about at this fintech company that I work for. So I'm, giving myself the stepping stones in terms of knowledge and education as I see fit to lead myself to my nonprofit goal. And that's just the, that's just the educational side of it. But the second piece of it is how do I financially afford that? So that's just like stacking savings on the assumption that at some point I'm going to be paid pennies on the dollar for my work. Right. But I think it's a beautiful example and I think it's a beautiful goal, but it's so rooted in, in a, in a career choice. So for you, is it maybe not, is it the lifestyle? Like I'm trying to break it down for me in my head. So for you, when you look at things like that, nonprofit, you don't make a lot of money on purpose, but you're making a difference. So is it the feeling that you want to make the change in the world and you're trying to build the roadmap to get there? So it's technically a personal goal. 
It, it's a hundred percent a personal goal, but it's tied to like, I make everything tied to everything that I do in life. Right. So I want to always move with intention. So me wanting to be a yoga instructor, that's me wanting to have more mindfulness, right. Overall, because one of the things that blew my mind when I was going through the yoga instructor process is how mentally challenging it is to just be present in a room uh, and not just like doing yoga, like present in a room, focusing on myself and what my faults are so that I can improve on the other people that are around me trying to practice. Um, but same thing with like running a nonprofit. I, I have a lot of all ul- ulterior, all ul- the, the, the ulterior motives. Um, specifically, I think if I do run the right type of nonprofit, it can quietly become a space to lobby for better education like not just public education, but like education across the board for all kinds of people, particularly immigrants and people that need additional assistance when they come into our country. So I I plan to utilize it to help lobby the spaces that I think need help the most. And that's that sits in the back of my head, right? So did I answer your question? I feel like I'm I'm very amped up about this. No, no, no. I think it's my no. I think it's beautiful. I think you're totally skirting around my initial question, but it's becoming <laughs> a beautiful sentiment. So I'm kind of letting you run. But you said something so beautiful, um, moving with intention, which I think we can both totally beat the drum of our lives around. Whether mine is like so lofty and not as organized as yours, which is such an explanation of who we are as people, but. Um, how do you like, what's the barometer where you're like, God, I'm getting too off course. Like, do you actually write these things down? Like, is it on that computer that I have to throw into the sound one day when you will never die? But in case you do, is that where yes. it lives? And how often do you look at it? So I used to look at it weekly. I don't have as much time anymore since um, <clears throat> things are picking up at work. But I, I absolutely revisit it at least once a month. And I stare at it and I put steps like – the yoga instructor one is kind of floating away from me right now because I just don't know when I'm going to be able to achieve it mm-hmm. with the amount of effort that it would take to to revisit that. But everything else, absolutely. I think the more you stare at your goals and you tell yourself that you're going to achieve them and the more you build up like specific things. Like I was – my one of my final goals is – what the final – what's the way to think about this? Like the final boss stage – before I'm like ready to jump ship is twofold, right? It's the financial side of running a nonprofit. So feeling like I have enough savings to make sure that I can maintain a lifestyle that is both comfortable for myself and my family. And then secondarily, it's my final goal is to be the CFO of a bank. Because once I'm the CFO of a bank, I know how it runs. I understand it financially and I can turn, I can easily turn a nonprofit at that point. But I I want to get to the CFO of a bank level before I feel like I can turn a nonprofit into something successful. Mm. But again, with building steps, like taking the steps and understanding how you're going to achieve that goal, you can't just say, I want to be president of the United States tomorrow. You have to be like, how am I going to get there? That's researching other people. So I also know, you know, Melinda Gates, right? Um, the things that she's done aside from, you know, marrying Bill Gates to get to the amazing entity that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is Um, there. And there are so many other examples of that where you can take a look at people that have done something, whatever your end ending personal goal is. So like a really great yoga instructor, for example, and then turn to them and be like, how did you get to where you are today? And, you know, the one that inspired me the most here in Denver, she turned to me and she was like, I have been practicing all my life. And I was like, it makes sense for me to share my love with others. And I was like, that is such a powerful statement. And she was the reason that I was like, you know, I'm going to sign up for certified training. I have no reason. I had no reason at the time to, to not put forth the effort. So, uh, you know, and then I look at really cool moms and I'm like, hmm. I would like to be a mom someday. Like yeah. a cool mom though. Yeah, cool mom. <laughs> cool mom. I'm just trying to be Weird cool mom. mom. Cool mom. No, I think, um, God, I think we talked about this a long time ago. We never acted on it. But I think I asked you, I was like, what's like our mission statement um, in life? I, I'm sure this was over a couple of glasses of wine. But um, 
life mission statement. Wait, do we have one that's together no, and no, then no. separate? Our oh, individual okay. ones. So of course yeah. we probably need one for our business. So there's that, but that's more, you know. That's your job. That's not my job. That's your yeah, job. I know I'm trying. <laughs> um, but no, I, um, that's really, it's hitting a chord with me and it's very personal to me, but I've been seeing like a life coach over this past year. Um, this year has been tumultuous. I feel like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I putting enough effort into the things I want to do? Am I putting myself first? How do I do that? How to become more selfish, which by the way, is a positive word. I'm trying to spin it that way. Um, and for me, I really, it took me a long time and, and I've come to the, to terms with what do I want to do in my life? And I, um, I believe laughter is the best medicine I've decided. And if I can make someone laugh every single day and feel good about themselves, like I will feel fulfilled, not like be the class clown, but to do something that makes people feel good, like, or just have a moment of escapism and, and really, uh, feel good. I, I don't know. I'm like right there with you. I get that. Yeah. I totally, I I'm like, no I'm noodling on it, but I, you know, I'm not as dialed as you as to what that looks like, but trying to write it down and trying to make steps towards what does that look like is like my ultimate work-life balance like how do I make those things mesh in a way that makes me still feel good every time I show up to do the work yeah, for sure and I know not every day is going to be fucking awesome but I would like to get to you know 90 percent that would yeah. be nice that'd well, be nice for me so and this actually reminds me of an exercise that I had to go through this morning when I was uh figuring out my honeymoon with Nick so and it's it's a really great example of how you can figure out like opportunity costs which I feel like a lot of people don't typically examine when it comes to their personal goals, but this is how I view any massive decision change. So like me saying, I'm going to move to California. Mm -hmm. I had to do this. And um, similarly, if we like reel it in and take a look at whether or not I want to spend my miles versus just pay cash for business class on a flight to where Nick and I are honeymooning, I make like a chart and I'm like, okay, what are the actual costs here and what are the actual benefits? But for me, I already know the benefits, right? Like moving to California to be near my nephew, infinite joy. So the actual costs are what is the, the physical cost differential between living in California versus living in Colorado? How do I mitigate that? Mm. Um, and, and do I want to mitigate that? Like, do I want to live the same quality life that I'm living here in Colorado or, or, or am I okay with something less than, right? And then in addition to that, like how much will it cost us to move? How does that affect our future projections? Um, Nick and I are starting to invest, co-invest together. So when we do that, like does that affect how either of us will be able to invest because does it shift our overall ability to pay for things since our salaries won't be changing if we go to California, although our cost of living will be going up by X percent. Like things like that and and understanding exactly what your opportunity cost is financially tends to help me make more nuanced decisions surrounding big emotional change. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily contemplate. Um, and like I was saying, to dumb it down, if you're going to use miles versus cash, it's super easy to like go through the entire flow and like write it out. So my the easiest way to coach someone through it, which is kind of how I did it with my sister, is to do it with something easy first, okay. like write down all of the opportunity costs with something super simple and then build it up to the more complicated stuff like moving across the country. Yeah. So my lofty goal of <laughs> 50,000 foot view of I want to make people feel good and experience and have escapism every day. Like I need to break it down a lot further. Okay. So yeah. we can talk about the goals that we've talked about together that you've asked me. Like I want to move to Chicago in a year. How do yeah. I get there in a year? Yeah. Right. In, in five years, I want to start my own business. How do I work my way backwards there? This, this is like becoming a nice little workbook that can be on our website. I'm like dialing it in my head right now. <laughs> um, you know, how do you set those, you know, big lofty goals for your life and actually achieve them and then tie in all the financial learnings that we've had together um, to those, like knowing what your numbers are, doing the research on who you believe your North Star is, like who has the life you want to live and how did they yeah. get there? Maybe set how, up a combo they, with them. Yeah. Yes. Go find them on LinkedIn. Ping them. I'm, most people are willing to have the conversation with you and be like, this is how I got here. Yeah. This is what I recommend you do. This is what yeah. I did wrong. Yeah, for sure. And and like you just said, building backwards from those dream goals 
every single time. And also understanding all the financial impact. Do you want to move to Chicago in a year? You need to have a savings fund for it. You need to figure out how much that savings fund needs to be. Uh, I would assume that, you know, your cost of living probably isn't going to change too, too much, but that's research that you need to do, right? Like, so spending the time and understanding where do you want to live? How much is that going to cost? Will it cost more? Will it cost less? What changes in your life are going to affect you? Like, is Chicago as walkable as Seattle? Can you, you know what I mean? Mm. All of those things are going to affect you dramatically because you might have to buy a car. You might become a metro, if that's what it's called in Chicago, rail pass person, all of the things. Hmm. Are you going to buy a house when you move to Chicago? What did that co- cost look like to buy a house in Chicago? Like how much do you have to have saved to live there? You know, these are all questions that you have to ask yourself Absolutely. well in advance of when you're moving there. And you should be creating those stepping stones in your workbook or work, your computer that goes into the ocean if you die. <laughs> every t- every know, time. Okay. I want you to take mine. Have you ever seen Office Space, the movie? Yeah, of course. Okay. You know how they take out the the fax machine or the printer and they have that slow-mo with the bat? You have to yeah. do that with oh, yeah. all of my PCs. I don't want you throwing it in the ocean. It'll wash up on a shore somewhere. I don't want that. I want you huh. to smash it with a baseball bat. Okay. And then, I have not forgotten this, you have to take a $5 bill. I'm not doing that. And you have to not charter a boat. Are you listening? You have to charter I'm a boat with the rest that. of the money I give you. I'm not and then you that. in Lake Michigan in the middle, I'm you have to that. do a little ceremony and I'm rip not it up doing that. <laughs> and throw it in. Do you do you have your uh do you have your trust and will planned already? Like no. is this in the, the paperwork? Okay. Then I'm not doing it. <laughs> it's in my head. It'll be written. <laughs> it shall be written. There's just going to be like a note somewhere that says Syra has to do this. You, you know, it'll be a uh, note in a place you'll never think of. But when you find it, you'll like tear up a little bit, but also laugh. <laughs> I just want you to know that in advance. <laughs> just make sure you fold it like one of those fortune cookie things that we used to do when we were in middle school. And then I'll be down. A thousand percent. Okay. All right. A thousand deal. percent. So what are your thoughts now that you've heard my neuroses on how I achieve goals i feel so naked right now by the way (laughs) i don't know what that means because i'm like a never nude but um uh, i honestly want you to put yeah i'm giving you homework because you have time i want you to put together like a, a template for me or for people for our listeners not just for me of how you set personal goals and and kind of the the process of kind of coming back to them i think there's a nice synergy between how you set financial goals and how you set personal goals and kind of bridge those gaps together. So I think that should be an exercise we work on collectively. Like Mm. I think you throw me some ideas. I can put it into a thing. We put it on our website. People can use it and tell us if it's shit or not. That's, that's kind of how I feel. Like it's nice to have those things up. Like I used to write it like affirmations on my mirror, not in lipstick, but in a dry erase marker. on the lipstick thing, like kind of, okay, dry erase marker. Dry erase marker. Does, does dry erase good. marker always erase from a mirror? Yeah. It's great. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I'm down to come up with a template. I would love to get feedback from some of our listeners though. So if you guys have something already that kind of works but needs tweaking, or if you heard me say something that sounds insane, feel free to DM either one of us. Let's talk about it. Let's turn it into a conversation because this, like I said, I'm super naked. I don't usually share, you know, I, I feel like other people probably write down thoughts, ideas, and whatever in their diary. I am an executionist and I only write down my goals. And I don't even share my emotions about them. So the fact that I shared my emotions about both fertility and the nonprofit thing, uh, I feel like I had so much word vomit today. So let's have the conversation with everyone. And let's also end this episode relatively soon because I feel <laughs> like, oh, my God, a surprise, everybody. Cyrus a real person and has feelings <laughs> about things. I oh hate you. God. <laughs> it's revolutionary. It's a renaissance. I am a robot um, mm-hmm. and slightly insane. So, OK, cool. Cool, cool, cool. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we did this. I think it's super awesome to hear your thought process because we've talked about this. You're like. I have personal goals for myself every year, every five years, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so overwhelmed. So it's nice to hear you kind of break it down a little bit more so I can solidify things maybe a little bit more and get more organized when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. The irony is I'm very organized at work, but my personal life can be kind of all over the map. So 
I think many yeah, but, people probably you, feel that way. Yeah. 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 Most people probably don't have as much rigor, m- mental anxiety, uh, rigor, mental anxiety, same thing to want to have these kinds of goals the way that, but, but perhaps it's super helpful. We'll, we'll find out next time on girls just want to have fun <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you for letting me wrap. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye.